Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming along to uh, listen to the synergies between arable and dairy. So, first of all, let me just uh, by thanking uh, our sponsorship partners, Beef and Land New Zealand, Dairy New Zealand, uh, Ag Mart, and FMG, and also our supporting, uh, supporting sponsors, Foundation for Arable Research, Land Corp, and the McKenzie Foundation, who's, without whose help, uh, obviously none of this would be be possible, but also uh, not just in terms of funding, but also the context that they provided um, for myself in terms of study. So a little bit about uh, myself, uh, other than what Anthony's already told you. Um, I've been farming since 1985 in a family farming business, uh, married to Heather. Uh, we have three daughters, Hannah who's 21, we just celebrated her 21st last weekend. Uh, Ella, who's 18, and Molly, who's 13, um, in the outside of farming, and in my spare time, I also enjoy uh, classic cars, snowboarding, and uh, my family. But, uh, not necessarily in the order. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed Heather's back in the room, she was next door before. So. Um, and so, farming enterprise uh, is reasonably diverse, um, it includes arable, sheep, beef, deer, dairy, dairy support. And, so more recently retail, um, which is a story for another day. Crops that we grow in the, in the arable uh, operation or arable rotation, if you like, uh, wheat, barley, uh, seed peas, grass seed, kale, fodder beet, sweet, and pasture. And that varies, there's a longer list of that that we often use as well, but they're all grown as in part of a rotation. And most of those crops uh, now, as it turns out, used in the dairy industry. We've seen a big increase in dairy in our area. Most of those crops, one way or another, finish up in the dairy industry. In terms of livestock, we have red deer, Angus cattle, uh, ticks we use. We also finish a number of livestock operations, including lambs, cattle, and deer. Uh, sometimes 15,000 lambs per season. And last year, about 1,000 deer. Uh, dairy support, as I said, has become a big part of our business from raising calves and heifers uh, through to mixed stage, the winter and the mixed stage cows. They come to us for 10 weeks over the winter period when they've been dried off uh, from the dairy palace, and we can have anything from 7 to 10,000 cows on the farm uh, over that 10 week period. So, the synergies between arable and dairy. To consider how these two sectors can work together to minimise the effects on the environment and continue to be economically sustainable in a way that's socially acceptable. That was the easiest, uh, the easiest part of my project. <coughs> um, and, and like everyone says, you know, I didn't find the answers I was looking for. And if you've come here looking for answers, I can serve that perhaps you're in the wrong room. To give a little bit of background about the New Zealand dairy industry in, in terms of intensification and what's happened in the last 20 years, we take a look at this graph, which shows that in the last 20 years, dairy numbers, the line down the black, uh, dairy numbers have increased by almost doubled from 3.5 million to approximately 7 million. And over that time, we've seen the, the beef numbers and sheep numbers uh, drop considerably, or almost 40%. Um, and then if we take a look at the milk intensification in terms of uh, the average milk solids per cow, uh, it's lifted by some 20% over the last 15 years. And cows per hectare is also lifted by some 20%. So, which paints a picture of a you know, dramatic intensification, in, particularly in dairy numbers and, and, and production. And it must also be considered that over that period we've seen a lift in land values by some 800 per cent. Part of their operation, as I said, involves the wintering of, of those uh, animals over that 10 week period. And they mostly fed on those forage crops uh, outdoors in situ, as opposed to what happens in a lot of other places in the world. And what we're beginning to see is, is pitches that aren't perhaps as acceptable as we might like. Um, people who are not involved with agriculture and consider themselves um, detached from agriculture 
see images such as this and, and while they're probably looking at the animal health perspective, um, many of us start looking at the, the soils and the damage and the nutrient losses that have been that are occurring. And while we do our best to minimise these, uh, we do live in a, in a climate that uh, dictates the, what happens rather than, we, we don't have a lot of control over, over what the climate does. We do our best to mitigate any of those issues and try and pick paddocks and types of crops that can minimise any damage. And these are all the pictures that we want to paint, but inevitably it's not always the case. But what also can be a, an issue and, and concerned me was the damage that we do in those situations to the following, or to the soil and the following crop. And it's uh, often uh, quite a dramatic feature. Uh, this particular photo was taken in September, October of 2013. It's a crop of spring barley, but if we if we rewind back to June of that year, uh, the paddock was in uh, Swedes, and the left hand side of the picture was a particularly wet week, and the right hand side of the picture was a was a more normal or drier week. Um, the, the difference between those two sides was uh, was this might seem not too bad for us from an Australian perspective, but seven tonne to the hectare on the left. Resulting seed crop and 11 tonne per hectare on the right. Uh, so, some $1,600 per hectare difference in gross margin. Uh, so, and that will take more than one year to fix. If we look at where the dairy wintering fits within our rotation and, and the contribution it makes to our, to our income, um, it's right up near the top. The um, graph there shows. A variety of crops that fit within most cropping rotations in New Zealand. Um, right up the top there is the forage um, component uh, with Swedes and cow in the top three. So they do contribute significantly to our income. So I was left with a few questions uh, thinking on my, as I embark on my travels. Um, I wanted to look at what feeds were being used in the US systems internationally. And is the indoor model able to be adapted to suit the wintering systems currently implemented in New Zealand? How does dairy deal, how does dairy deal with imported nutrients? And where does the arable system fit? First of all, I, I looked at alternative feeds, and this was going to be my uh, silver bullet moment, but it uh, turned out not to be. I had the idea that I was going to search the world and find a crop that would be uh, acceptable for us to grow and, and fit the dairy feed model perfectly and decrease our environmental footprint. The reality was that didn't happen. Um, what I did find out was that most of the feeds being grown, uh, the focus was on poultry or pig, and if it was beef or dairy, the, the feeds being used tended to be a byproduct of something else. For example, in California, there was uh, almond holes being used um, as an energy source. Uh, Europe, we saw uh, beet pulp, so sugar beet or beet being grown for sugar production, and then the pulp being fed as an energy source. Palm kernel extract, also used in New Zealand, but used uh, in the EU as well. Uh, confectionery was something that I hadn't considered, but uh, many places were able to use confectionery. Um, as part of their mix um, and sourced through cheap. But the same with distillers grain, a byproduct of uh, ethanol production in, in North America. And bread, who would have thought bread could be used uh, as a stock feed and could be bought cheaper than wheat? Four o'clock in the afternoon, the supermarkets need to have fresh bread on the shelves. And when the supermarket closes at 6 pm, it's uh, going to be used for the following day. New Zealand's population uh, means that we don't have those kind of opportunities. I spent some time in northern Louisiana, and the week that I was there, I, I was expecting that I would see cotton grown in, in maize, but I didn't. The reality, the reality was, I didn't see either of those crops in any large scale. What I did find was a lot of chickens, and. 
and it got me to thinking about their industry, the chicken industry here. It was a, quite a diverse um, system where you couldn't have chicken sheds without having land to spread the litter. Makes sense, I guess. But they were then bringing in uh, beef breeding cows onto that land. Climate was so, as such, and the soils were as such, they couldn't go grow particularly good grass. They would then move those animals to the feedlots further north and closer to where the grain was. Also, the biodigestion, by default, I visited many uh, biodigestion or AP sites, uh, mostly attached to dairy farms, and this particular one's at Campbell Farms in the UK. Um, effluent from around 750 cows going in there, uh, cost something like $4,000 per cow to set up. And was producing around 250 kilowatts of energy, or had the potential to. Um, but it also needed 55 hectares of energy maze to feed it as well to get the balance right, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And also the fact that they couldn't get the fuel clean enough to, to burn to drive the engine that was powering them and supposed to power the grid. I saw these type of systems also in the US, most successful on being at Fair Oaks Farms, but what we have to remember is that they were totally reliant on government subsidies to make them work. In the Netherlands, I, I spent some time looking at robotic milking, um, and I kind of got to thinking maybe that these systems could be used in New Zealand and our, our arable farms. What tends to happen is in the Netherlands, they were used in either one or two. A dairy farm came up between 60 and 80 cows each, and they were used as part of what would be called a, a total mixed ration system. So the cows would be fully indoors and the feed would be cut and carried to them. Reasonably simple systems and well suited for the robotic milking. But if we could take that to New Zealand and use it as part of a rotation on a cropping farm, I could see huge advantages whereby we could either bring the feed into a feed pad system when, and be fed out in the bushel soup and have the animals on grass or on pasture in, in the times when the weather was unsuitable. We could then capture the nutrients and apply them to the soil at the time when it was more suitable and bring the feed into them. Something that uh, we're very keen to try and implement on their farm. If we can, we can't justify the expense of putting just a wintering shed in because the economics don't stack up. There has to be an element of milk in there as well to make it pay for itself. <coughs> While I spent some time in uh, Nebraska, I visited uh, Double Dutch Farms, uh, which is a 5,000 cow dairy unit sitting on 150 acres that didn't own any land um, to uh, grow crops on. They relied solely on the surrounding cropping farms. Uh, they used the a formula based on the Chicago Wood of Trade, where they would buy the, where they would set the price for the maize and then buy it off the farm. The advantage for the, for the farmer being he gets paddock back a month earlier rather than holding off and selling his maize seed or maize grain to his truck for silage. For some 100 kilometres of underground pipes that were feeding the effluent from the dairy unit. To the surrounding dairy farms, uh, to the surrounding cropping farms. The system that seemed to work very well. So, some conclusions that I came to was that the New Zealand dairy system is quite unique. Being a grass based system with low cost, potentially we, we have had the more efficiencies than many of the total nutrition systems globally. I think that's set to change. We're quite in insulated um, by our isolation in, in the fact that uh, we have uh, sea borders and which enables us to be competitive uh, or makes it more difficult for us to be competitive and we have to retain a low cost situation or low cost of production. Population brings both opportunity and threats and I guess that's going back to the breadth and the confectionery of alternative feeds. Uh, they tend to be byproducts of something else, which is also something that New Zealand is not exposed to. Feeding 9 billion people by 2050 with less land, less resources will require some fundamental changes in the way we produce food, particularly around the environmental restrictions that are likely to be placed on us in the future. 
In the affairs it does have its place in New Zealand, but as I said, economically it's uh, unsatisfactory to expect to be able to build a, uh, a wintering run and then just winter cows and it's got to be a, an element of, of milking it in there as well to extend that lactation. Monocultures haven't been successful in anywhere in the world and we needn't expect them to be in New Zealand or Australia. If we look at the UK system where all the animals have been shifted to the west and the crops have grown in the east, they find it very difficult with transport costs and so forth to get the benefits that both industries need. Environmental regulation will add cost to food production. So, I've still got this burning question. How do we get the balance right? From the social perspective, the economic perspective, and the environmental perspective. Thank you.